Hi, and welcome to Leadering. I'm Nancy Giordano, and I'm really excited to have you here as we dive into this new concept of thinking about how we um, use our organizational resources and capacities and curiosities and equities to shift to build uh, what I would call a much better next. Uh, I am uh, explaining these, uh, this thinking about why I wrote this book and what leadering means over a course of eight conversations, maybe more, but we'll start with eight, uh, that help introduce it and that also introduce you to uh, what I describe as pinkers, people you need to know. These are people who are global executives, they're thought leaders, they're practitioners in this that are actively working to build, again, this better next, this transformative future, and they can give us an insight as to how they think about it. Um, I'm excited to talk to you about like what leadering is, why I wrote this book, why I think it matters, where I think it's going, what does it look like to thrive, which is what we'll describe today. Uh, but before we dive in, I would invite us all just to take a really deep breath. I honestly think it is the most important tactic or practice or skill that we need to be able to navigate this world of constant transformation and increasing complexity. It is something I do every day. It is something I open every keynote with. It is something I do almost, you know, uh, certainly before every meeting, sometimes during a meeting, um, as I hit various walls of either, you know, frustration or concentration or just a sense of wanting to feel as though I can step back for a second and reflect on what it is that's happening, potentially pivot if necessary, give myself some space to take in some new information. And remember that it is that we've actually, you know, been down many, many roads of of change and transformation over the last certainly years, certainly year, um, but also decades, um, and that we are, you know, we've been building this capacity to be able to take on more. So we're in this moment in time now where we are standing at the threshold of what I would think is a transformative future, right? Exponential technologies, increasing consciousness about how to take good care of each other, thinking about stewarding our resources in more effective and more caring ways, I think open up so many portholes to what it is that, uh, is available to us as we move forward. So the question is, you know, what is leadering and why did I write this book? So leadering really is an invitation to think about things differently, to approach it differently. I would argue that there was a 20th century way in which we built business that was very effective at the time, lifted billions out of poverty, and it has um, certainly created global brands that we are very proud of and been very successful for many businesses, but it has now run its course. And in the 21st century, we're being asked to think about things very, very differently. And so with that comes a different way of leading, one that is dynamic and inclusive and caring as opposed to closed and static and hierarchical intentionally, one that actually supports innovation and constant experimentation as opposed to is really trying to just build the most consistent, like most efficient, most replicable, if you will, uh, process. This is a mindset, right? We're moving into a place where we can think about things again in times to be able to sense and respond in real time and sets the goal differently. Instead of short-term profitability and consistent growth month after month and quarter after quarter, or year after year, uh, we actually think about it much longer term. We're, we're about creating sustainable value in the short term. We still want to be profitable. Uh, but takes the lens much longer over the course of years and decades, and I would argue, of course, generations, and thinks about the impact of the work that we do. This is the invitation of the moment that we are in, and this is what I describe as leadering. Leadering is this dynamic set of practices. It is an approach in which we build confidence in being able to steward, uh, you know, our, our resources in unknown territory. It's about the idea of moving from having a, you know, well-worn but outdated map to being able to navigate with a compass and a North Star. Or maybe another way of thinking about it is that we throw out the old playbook and we build again the set of practices, which we will again um, dive into more in the next few sessions. So um, that is what it is. The question is, why did I write it? And I wrote it for three reasons. One, enthusiasm, frustration, and fear, sort of all combined. So I am very, very excited about what it is that is possible as we reimagine, re rethink, redesign, you know, kind of re-scope every industry, every organization, every um, way in which we've tried to solve problems in the past, from education to finance to medicine to food. Uh, they're all going to be, you know, as we see now, even um, rethought, which I think is good because I think if you look at the past, there have certainly been breakdowns that are becoming more visible. Uh, folks that didn't always, you know, uh, feel as though they were the beneficiaries of all this thinking. And I think there's a way to, again, to build it better. So I get excited about what's possible. 
you know, where I'm frustrated by are the companies or the organizations, the industries who don't think that there's any real need to change, who feels that they can kind of just you know, sort of tread water and wait till the killer application comes through and then kind of jump on the train. Uh, and I think that they're squandering resources and squandering potential and certainly frustrating many of the people who work with them and are going to continue to lose not just customers, but also talent. So I, I, you know, I think, and, and honestly, it's mostly incumbent industries, right? They want to hold on to what it is that they have and are creating a lot of confusion about what is available in the future. So they're not only just hurting themselves, they're really confusing the rest of us about what makes sense and what doesn't. Um, and then the only thing I think that is dangerous is that there are those on the front end who are really excited about what's happening and are, can't wait to you know, apply this thinking and these resources, see huge opportunities and are diving right in, but often then apply an outdated business model to that. We see that in social media, we can see that in other industries. We're currently seeing that in the energy sector here in Texas after having just gone through our quite an extraordinary and unbelievably difficult experience. And so as we see these you know, breakdowns of trying to apply old thinking to a new world, we're realizing it doesn't work. And so we have to think about these things differently and make sure that we're holding people safely into the future that we are building. This is the mandate of the work that we are doing ahead. So I think leadering again just frames it in a way that we can see how we get there by um, building practices of curiosity, you know, being open to wonder, not resisting change, but figuring out how to steward it in a way that um, again serves us all well, doing it collectively, not doing it all alone, building ecosystems of support, thinking about how we contribute versus just extract the resources that we're able to build with, um, learning again to build capacities to learn and to um, steward new terrain. So these are all the things that we'll sort of talk about in succession. Um, but it seems more fun to start with what it looks like to thrive, right? The book has a fair amount of tough love uh, woven into lots of inspiring stories and anecdotes and statistics and case studies. Um, and one of my favorite is this idea of um, what does it look like to take an incumbent organization that's been around for a very, very long time, 373 years and uh, bring such a fresh way of thinking and understanding how to integrate these technologies and again, ways that hold people well, that it becomes uh, lauded as the number one most innovative industry or organization in its country. So in Norway, Norway Post or Post in Norge was literally uh, acknowledged as the number one most innovative organization in the country in 2019. And I think that that is quite fascinating. Um, so I'm excited to introduce you guys to Alexander Hennig. He is the director of uh, digital transformation for the organization. And, uh, you know, what's fascinating is not only the work that they've done in bringing in like robotic process automation to be able to integrate multiple IT systems or thinking about how to bring AI and chatbots in to run uh, not just call centers, but, you know, customer service, whatever you want to call them, centers in which people can ask questions in all different forms in three different languages, 24 seven. And if they aren't getting satisfied in that way, get escalated to a human in a way that feels, you know, like not frustrating and very um, satisfying in the experience. Uh, but they continue to test things with e-commerce, with parcel lockers, et cetera, et cetera. So it will continue to go. So they don't stand still and go, oh gosh, we, we made it, you know, through this moment in time and now we can rest. They continue to have this culture of experimentation and innovation and, and um, thriving. So, uh, but what I think is actually really interesting is that Alexander and I met uh, several years ago in Oslo at a conference and, you know, hooked up with each other on um, social media, but never really spent much time talking to each other. We just followed each other's work. And one day, a year or two ago, he posted something on Instagram Live, or I guess not Instagram Live, posted a video on Instagram. There was just a two minute case study on a new project that they had rolled out, these parcel lockers and what it took to get there. And in just two minutes, he gave a really compelling case study. And I thought it was fascinating that someone not only does his work well, but realizes the importance of sharing the story and using these platforms to be able to engage others, both as you know, inside and outside the organization is a way of being able to galvanize um, the possibilities that are there. So recognizing as you know, a leader of the 21st century that this is an important part of our work. We see Satya Nadella do it at Microsoft. We uh, saw Steve Jobs do it back in the day when he did it his way. Um, we see Jacinda Arden do it. We see many leaders that we admire really recognizing this need to connect with one another and tell each other um, the stories of the work that we are doing. So with that, I turn you on to Alexander and uh, 
12 minute excerpt of a longer conversation that he and I had that we will probably post somewhere in the future. But for now, hopefully this gives you a good taste of um, how he's approaching it and some um, lessons that I think he sets up for us as the book continues because he really hits on almost everything that I um, am writing about in longer form in the book. Enjoy. I don't know how you start to tell the story. Do you remember the two minute bit that you did on Instagram? Yep. yep. So remind us of that. So uh, the pitch was that to succeed with innovation, you need to have the backing of the top management. And that's so overlooked. And it doesn't matter if you have the best ideas and the best people, if you don't have that backing, you won't succeed. So that's the one point. And the second point was you need to have a curious organization to go out and actually try new stuff and break stuff. So that's my two tips. And uh, just so you know, Nancy, uh, MIT, Stone School of Management, actually did a case study on oh. Boston and our innovation method. And actually, I guest lectured in Boston the, uh, November of 2019 when you could actually travel. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's it. Yeah. I took a peek actually at the MIT because I haven't read the whole thing through, but they talk about the Helix method. Yep. Right. So can you explain that? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's our method for innovation and it's based on, you know, design thinking, all the best practices, agile, but we've made it to work for us or a huge organization, 15,000 employees. So we needed to find our way of doing this. And it's about three things, basically it's three step process. You need to actually spend time on the problem. And you need to do prototype to see if you can actually solve that problem for someone. Then you have a pilot phase where you actually pilot the thing to see if it works uh, with real users, even though everything else behind it is fake. And then you have the implement phase where we actually scale it. And that's the power of corporate innovation compared to a startup innovation is with a huge corporation with all the resources, you can actually scale fast mm. and, and, and a huge scale. The pilot fees, even prior, I guess, to piloting, but the really the place when you talk about having a curious organization, it's not just curious people, it's the processes that allow you inside an organization to test and, you know, sense and respond to innovation, right? And that piece yeah, that is so right. critical and the part that often yes. people miss in this whole yeah. thing. There are many experiments I'm sure that you've run that have not been as successful and you've chosen not to scale. Definitely. Correct? And that is just as important as actually uh, moving um, projects along that those phases is to kill the ones who need to be killed. Because as you know, in a large organization, if you have the funding, you have the milestones, you have, you know, you're supposed to deliver on this project and it's all set up. And then you find out halfway, it doesn't really work at all, does it? Do you kill the project? You promised, you know, the, the right. management team or you promised the project manager that you're going to deliver this big thing and go back and say, like, this was a really bad idea. Let's cancel it. Uh, you mentioned in your book uh, the thing that we're now scaling up uh, package lockers across all, all of, the, of Norway. And the thing is, we tried that twice before. Ah. It failed twice before. So when I started three years ago, and I've seen other countries where this has succeeded, I say, shouldn't we try parcel lockers? And they say, well, we tried that twice before. It doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard but that before. What happened in the meantime was the technology advanced. So the parcel lockers we're putting out now doesn't require power. It's battery operated mm -hmm. and the battery lasts 10 years. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need internet or Wi-Fi. It's Bluetooth. So it just talks to the phone of the mailman and to the person getting the parcel. And they can be outside and they're so easy to place out and much cheaper, of course. So that's another thing to know that even though something failed, doesn't mean the idea is wrong. It might be their bad timing. Right. I, I totally agree with that. But then again, I would say, so my... Hope is that the other two attempts that you made to do that gave you some insight that when you did it the third time, made it clear about what to do. So it wasn't just Definitely. that the technology had advanced and the other things, but that it was worth doing the learning in the first two rounds. Because I think that trying to time it exactly perfectly to know exactly when you're supposed to be there is also a challenge, right? So even if you are a little ahead of the curve um, in total you know, viability, it still seems as though it's worth experimenting with that. Yes, and you need to co collect that knowledge somehow. It could be in the people uh, that will work on something adjacent, so they can you know, still be on top of what's happening in that field, which you documented in a, a report somehow, a system, computer system, but that's so important to gather all that knowledge because it's so useful for the next project and next project. So let's talk about the scaling portion then of it again. So you've gone now through the identifying the right project and thinking you can solve it, you've tested for it and built a prototype and realized that it is successful. Getting everyone in the organization on board seems to be one of the other challenges though. That doesn't feel like it's a challenge there. What drives such success in scaling 
at Norway Post? Actually, I think that's the, that's the biggest challenge is taking it from doing prototypes and pilots and see we have the solution for this thing. And it might be not something that's very adjacent to the, the current business. It might be something, you know, a bit further out and actually get that jump from, yes, it works as a pilot to actually working as a service or a product. That's so hard. Uh, but if you've done your homework, <laughs> so to say, if you documented, there's a need there. We try this. We have some paying customers that try this. That's easier to get that buy-in from top management to actually put money. And that's the thing. The two first phases of the Helix model is very cheap. I mean, like going out, doing some prototypes, pilots, that's so cheap. It's actually the scaling part that's expensive. And that's why uh, you need to have a good business case at that point. But then you have all the knowledge from the two other phases that, you know, we know this, that there is a problem, there is a demand for the solution to the problem. So we should do it. So there's a training piece to it, right? You gotta make sure everyone feels that they're skilled and competent in being able to do whatever the new delivery is. But there's also, you know, we've certainly seen in many companies in the US that the fear of bringing that technology in will then replace me. Yes, and that's that's a common, uh, common issue. But the thing is, uh, I've also, I think people are smart enough to understand they they can't just use fax machines anymore, right? <laughs> you know, the fax machine is gone. And so for and in our business, uh, we feel it so well because our business for over 300 years have been delivering mail. And that's not a, a future business, right. let's be honest. <laughs> that's the decline. And it's declined, you know, a lot of- Well, except for the delivery of like door-to-door -door you know, things now, right? We, we, we have switched it from letters to boxes that show up at our house every day. Yeah. If you go into those success stories of huge innovations, you actually find that there's usually a reason they started it. And I was, they were fearful for something happening in the market. Something happened that they had to change. That's not a thing. You need to have patience. Because as we talked about a bit earlier, you need to build that knowledge about your customers, about the problems they are having, possible solutions, and also how you can utilize your current assets. Because I mean, you're a corporation, you have some current assets, but how can you put them together in a different way to provide a different service, a different product? But the key is, okay, so we will have a lot of senior leaders that hopefully read this book or watch these videos. So what is our advice to them? Because I think that you know, we can say that, you know, I guess, what, is, what has been successful at getting senior management buy-in or what do you want senior managers to know? Because I think part of it's trust, right? Because they also have worked on a certain framework. This is why we're calling it leadering instead of leadership, right? Everything that was considered to be good leadership in the 20th century, I believe, is now you know, uh, creating vulnerability and constraint in the 21st. So being able to shift your mindset to think about these things, about investing in experiments and knowing that things get killed sometimes along the way, that's not considered like, you know, abject failure or trying to figure out the, the, the human um, scaling part of it and the training part of it. Like, I guess, what is it that you think gets in the way of senior managers uh, giving that support and how can we help them? Well, I think it's fear, a fear of trying something new, uh, trying a new business model, trying to go into a different market than you're used to. But the thing is, what they need to realize is the biggest risk is doing nothing. So you need to know that not exploring and thinking about what are this company going to live of, of the next 5, 10, 20 years. If you don't think about that now, you're in big danger of being extinct. And your compensation is tied to short-term earnings. It is much harder to look at that long view and say, I care about what my business is going to be five years from now or 10 years from now, or even two years from now. Um, so I think that part of what we are, are trying to look at is from the whole system, how can we rejigger that? For me, it's a no-brainer to actually invest in the future of the company because it's such a fairly cheap way to do it. But we need to actually protect that and keep that away from the oper daily operations. I think that's a big failure if you, you have someone, someone executive responsible for the daily operations. And then also get you need to you know do some future stuff and innovation stuff. That fails because... What's, every, what's the crisis today is going to totally ruin your focus from what's going to happen 10 years from now. What is your next challenge that you can tell the world about? Like, what are you focused on now? Not so much about a delivery thing, but something in your world that you're... Um... So we're really focused on mega trends. Uh, and of course, e-commerce is a mega trend that's, you know, seen just during the pandemic. It's exploded in the US and also in Norway and the Nordics, as we see. So we're very focused on mega trends and what are our possibilities within those mega trends. Another mega trend we're focusing on is actually circular economy. So in the world today, uh, the done research says the world is about 9% circular. So that means we throw away 91% of our materials after we use it once. And then, you know, the best countries like the Netherlands, they are at 
So still the throw away is 76%. So I think that's going to be a huge shift. And there's going to be three forces driving that. It's going to make consumers who doesn't, you know, they, they won't stand for this anymore when they realize how much we use. Uh, the second thing is corporations. And we see that from big leading corporations saying, putting really strict terms in their contracts about their uh, subcontractors being more focused on this. And thirdly, we see uh, big, uh, big countries or uh, like the European Union came up with a green deal last year. And as part of their big green deal, they actually made a circular economy action plan ah. with specific uh, action points that they're going to do. And they already implemented two of them, which going to make new regulate, regulatory, sorry, they're going to make new regulatory uh, demands on corporations. So they have to do this. So how about these are digital and you can order a 3D printed spare part. So I think there's a huge opportunities for countries, for companies that sees the mega trends going on and actually act upon them instead of react upon them. I could not agree more. You call them mega trends, I'll call them big shifts, but this idea that these things come together, that now is the time. So these things, it's not just that one uh, either trend or shift is driving it. It is the confluence of those things that this is the right moment. And then I think it actually moves from the fringe to the center quite quickly. Right, it actually doesn't. Well, it all, all depends, and the impact for your company or your organization might not come now. It might not affect you at all. And I think that's the big challenge for leaders now because they see these technologies, they hear about the technologies, they might not quite understand them. And then nothing happens, and then nothing happens, and then suddenly everything happens. Right. Exactly. So if you take the postal service, I mean, we've been around for three hundred and seventy-three years, and we deliver mail, and then you have something called the radio was still delivered a lot of mail. And then you have uh, the, the telefax and you have telex and you have uh, radio and you have mo cell phones and you have phones and you have TV and we still have more and more letters. So like new technology, don't worry about it. We're fine. And then the internet comes <laughs> and people start sending email and then it just drops. It's an extraordinary time. I, 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 would you want to be back in history or in the future or now? Like we're across time. Where you... been, uh, well, not right now because uh, we are you know, in lockdown, but maybe two years from now. <laughs> That'd be great. No, but I think it's, you know, as you say, it's, it's an amazing time to be a human. There's so much technology evolving now, so many possibilities. And just like us talking now, I'm in lockdown in my house in Oslo, Norway. You're in Texas in the US and we can have this amazing conversation. I mean, this is so great. I mean, just seeing the, the start of all the possibilities around this. And I think the lockdown is just accelerating and the pandemic is just accelerating all this change coming. What I love about Alexander's thinking is about this idea of, you know, iterative design, about really getting out there and testing things, about really questioning this culture of failure. What does that mean? And recognizing that there are ways we can build organizational structure that support this or thwart this. You know, we can either be champions of it or we can be those who hold us back and I think what we're trying to do again is release that capacity to be able to you know move us forward thoughtfully caringly and faster why this matters is because when you talk to the folks who are building the future technologists scientists engineers you know scientists uh, entrepreneurs and ask them how far along we are almost universally you hear one percent only one percent into this future that can be so again uh, extraordinary and dynamic and certainly uh, look different than it does today. Uh, we'll cover that in a couple of days with Stephen Kotler when we describe what it means to wonder versus resist. But in the meantime, tomorrow we will dive into this conversation about why the playbook is dead.